Hey guys, can you guys hear me? So I'm not exactly gonna talk about rigging so much as I'm gonna talk about approach and strategy and just little things that I think about and consider before I even start rigging, okay? Like, uh, you don't wanna get up into a situation and be wholly unprepared for what's up there. So it usually, I mean it always, it starts with the ground. Now right now I don't have my saddle on because we're gonna have to use this as our makeshift pretend it's a tree situation. I'll try to make it as real as possible and we'll go with it from there. Uh, and we'll just call this bag uh, some sort of sensitive target. And so we have our tree over our sensitive target. And the first thing I do with this tree is I'm gonna inspect it. Now a lot of times it's pretty, uh, you know, it's, it's your nature to just jump into planning the rigging but first, I gotta inspect this tree because I gotta see what's going on with this tree. That's gonna vastly affect how I plan the rigging. That's vastly gonna affect what I'm gonna even think to do and how I'm gonna approach this. Right now, just looking at it, there's a big fat crack here. Big old crack right here. And we don't have, we don't have a top, we just have one big goofy limb way out here in no man's land over our target. No overhead rigging, no uh, other bit of tree structure. Uh, ignore the wooden banana coming out of the frame over there. <laughs> and uh, you can pretty much ignore this one too. So with that information right there, that's vastly gonna affect how am I gonna do this? Is this even possible to do with the equipment that we have? That's a real important thing too. You know, I could run up here, get my saddle on, start going up, and wing it, but I think a lot of you know from experience, I see some people who look like they've been doing tree work for a while, winging it's not always the greatest thing to do. You're gonna probably have to change your plan mid-direction anyway. So I like to try and gather all the information that I can from the ground before I even get involved in this. And one of the big ones too, like with a crack like that, is like, can we even do this? Let's just assume we can't get any large equipment back here. We can't get a spider lift. We can't get any of that stuff. This is it. We're on our own. Is this safe? And sometimes it's no. If it's no, then you got to know when to walk away. You got to know when to be like, look, I'm sorry. We can't get equipment back here. Either this has gone on for too long or this happened and there's not much we can do about it. Either you're going to have to be comfortable with some uh, property damage or you're gonna have to get somebody else to do it. That's just the nature of the beast, you know, because that is not worth your life right there. You all dig that? Anybody ever walk away from a job? Anybody? I see a couple smiles. <laughs> and that's what it came down to, right? It's like, we can't do this safely. We can't do this safely and I'm not gonna be the one. I know somebody will come here, bid this half price, risk their lives, and hopefully I won't hear about it on the news. Hopefully. And sometimes people get away with it and when they get away with it, they think, ah, oh, that was no big deal for the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. And the thing is about luck, if you keep relying on luck, it eventually runs out. Luck in the absence of skill is no way to live your life. So I've assessed the tree. It's got a crack in it. But let's just say for the sake of keeping this going that I'm like, all right, there's a crack but I think we can still do this. I don't think it's cracked too badly. I think I can get up this tree and make this happen while still being safe, while still being somewhat efficient. And now I'm gonna think to myself, okay, how am I gonna do that? I'm gonna start gathering the tools. I'm gonna see what we have, what we brought. I just got myself a, a climbing line here. Okay, it's a little tangled. We got a primary rigging line. And by the way, forgive the, uh, forgive the uh, kind of thrown together setup here. I flew across the country with it in the duffel bag, so it is what it is. And then I got a secondary drift line here, just in case I need it, or a tag line, or whatever it needs to be. I want to try and make this efficient, and I want to try and make it not complicated. And above all, I want to keep the load and the forces as low as possible on that situation. And when I get up there, I might even decide, yeah, I can't rig on this. We're gonna have to think of a different solution. 
So I've got two rigging points. Uh, I don't have any spurs, so just pretend that I'm spurring in my uh, composite toe Adidas. All right. I like to keep my slings kind of tidy, kind of tied up real tight. Sometimes, now not with these particular slings, these are ultra sling style. You guys pretty familiar with that? The ultra slings, it's got the pockets. So we go through the pocket and that's how we set it. Sometimes that pocket isn't quite there. So we gotta go to the other one and we end up with a long neck. So I will try to double wrap it and see if I can get the slop out of that. Not quite. Anyway, that's not where I'm putting it. So I like to keep things tidy. If this were a dead eye sling, sometimes I like to just put the rope through because I want to take the rope up with me anyway. I tend to try and cut out little steps in the whole operation. If I don't have to stop and ask for something, then I can keep moving forward. If it only takes me just a couple minutes on the ground to do something easily as opposed to let me get up there, let me put this on the tree, then send down the line, then tie on that thing, and then let's pull it back. Like it's, it's more steps to me and I like to eliminate little steps where I can, if you can do them easily on the ground, when it makes sense. Sometimes you're going up something with a big fat rope and it's gonna be extra weight and it doesn't make sense, but for my little intents and purposes, I try to cut those, I wouldn't call them cutting corners, I would call them like just, Little efficiencies, we call that a trick or tip. All right, so I got my climbing system upside down. I got me a little tagline. I'm pretty sure I'll need it. I like to take most things with me. Oftentimes, too, I do that just because it sort of saves having to have somebody um, running around and grabbing all that stuff. Like, if I just get everything that I'm going to need, have it, take what I need, that's not me, <laughs> then I don't have to wait for somebody to do it for me. I'm a little uh, impatient like that, I guess you could say. So I'll try to line up everything that I think I'm going to need and just go up with it. And I just, I like operating like that. Personal preference. All right. So as per our industry standards, I have to be tied in with a way to get to the ground. If I'm looking up at something like this, I'm probably not going to bother to throw a line over this. I see the crack from the ground, but I don't necessar necessarily know if this is going to be something I want to start hanging my weight off of. Even if I have spurs and a lanyard around it, I'm probably going to go up with a cinched system. So there's a number of ways to do it, but very simply, you can just do a bowling with a Yosemite finish. And now that's life support for you. And while it's not the funnest to flip up the tree with, it is your way to the ground. Now with this double rope system, I have to add friction if I'm gonna put the entirety of my weight and descend. There's a couple ways to do that. I do have a figure eight with me. I usually carry one. You could also get away with maybe a, a munter on one of these wider beaners. But this adds the necessary friction to rappel down on this knot should you need to rappel down for whatever reason. Now, is anybody, is anybody spurring up with a cinched system on the way up? Or are you guys just lanyard on? Anybody? Just spurring up with spurs on your, in your flip line? Or are you using the cinch system? Yeah, so if you're not doing it already, you're gonna wanna do it. It is, uh, it is our, our standard. Um, I know no one is out there necessarily watching you. But it's good practice to do these things, even if you're fairly confident and proficient. So I got my lanyard on as well. I'm flipping, I'm moving this. You know, it's not the fastest, but our situation is such that we don't wanna rush through anything. We wanna take our time to make sure we're gonna get this done safely. 
So now I'm spurred up to my defect or crack here. And I got to start thinking about, OK, how can I possibly do this? How can I distribute force in such a way that I'm not going to make the crack worse? Or is that even possible? Let's just say, for argument's sake, so we can keep talking, let's just say it's possible. Let's just say that, OK, I, I think I got an idea. I think what I'm going to do. And there's, a, you know, there's several ways to approach all these situations. And really, they're going to boil down to all those unique circumstances you're going to run into on your job site with your wood properties, your time of year. All, the, all these things play into wood strength and wood property. So I'm going to get a ring more or less down where I think the crack isn't bad. Maybe I'll put the other one even lower. Put one down into the solid wood. You really got to use your imaginations here. Pretend I'm not on just a stick strapped to a frame. I'll make sure that my climbing line and my rigging line are away from each other. So this little doodad that I'm pulling out, just a little friction device, just a little aerial friction device, I guess you could call it, since I'm using it in this application. Pull out my little drift line. So this is nothing groundbreaking here. This is nothing crazy new. The main purpose of what I'm talking about here is just to get you thinking in a strategic way, in a step-by-step -step way, to think about what are the dangers? How do I work around those dangers? How do I make sure that I'm safe during the danger? And how do we get this done semi-efficiently? So let's say you know I come up with cockamamie ideas and. This one, I'm just like, OK, you know what? I'm going to put the main rigging down in the more solid wood, and I'll have a little aerial friction device to cut down on the uh, lever arm right here. I'm just going to cut this piece, and this is, gonna, this is a far drop to get to your main rigging. I'm going to drift it down there with this aerial rigging. And what this does is have, it doesn't have the uh, doubling effect that a pulley or even a ring might. So I'm just going to lower this to this. Again, not groundbreaking. Nothing new, but it's just trying to get you to think in a step-by-step -step strategic way. You can come up with uh, solutions to these weird oddball problems if, if you've done sort of your due diligence and assessed possibilities. It might, you might just get up here, take one look at that crack, and be like, no way. There's no way in heck that we're going to be able to rig anything. Go to the hardware store, get about six sheets of plywood, and go to the tire store and get a bunch of tires, put it on that structure, and I'm going to get up as close as I can and cut you pizza boxes because that's just what it's got to be. You know, I can, I can undercut and break little pieces off and take it in bit by bit by bit. And I've arrived at that notion because I got up here, I assessed this wasn't going to be safe, and that wasn't going to work what I originally planned. 
So I'm trying to think strategically and safely at the same time. Lawrence has got the drift line set up and he's gonna be lowering it into the main system. Who's gonna be taking care of that climber or a loft or a ground worker, or et cetera? Uh, well, that sort of depends on how big the piece is. What did I do with that little funky thing? You know what, it doesn't even matter. You don't necessarily even need it. You can go old school. For those of you who don't know, and I have a feeling that a lot of you do know, because I see some guys out there who look like they've been doing tree work for a little while. You can wrap the rope towards the trunk, towards the crotch, and then tie it to your piece, and this will create aerial friction for you. And the reason you wrap towards the truck, let me get on this side to show it a little bit better. I'll get this out of the way real quick. So we're wrapping towards the trunk. And that's so that we can introduce slack when we need it. And this is, this is very old school. Um, do we have anybody who used to do this back in the day? Anybody? This is pre-blocks, pre-equipment. You don't do this with double braided rope. You do this with three strand or 16 strand because double braided rope, the cover and the core share the load. If you are running friction, you're running a double braided rope over uh, natural crotches, you're going to basically burn your cover up and that's going to leave more of the work to your core. You don't want to do that. 16 strand, three strand, the cover takes all the load. So what happens here, you make a cut, this drops, and now you can introduce slack because this is wrapped this way. If it was wrapped the other way, you could basically, you could pin the line and you wouldn't be able to introduce any more slack. If, these, if this wrap, for whatever, like if this is sloped, it's gonna do that and it's gonna pin your load and you're gonna have a load suspended in the air. So that's why we wrap towards the crotch so that you can always introduce slack, even, even if the ropes cross. And that's, it's super old school, but I just bring it up and I like to show it because to illustrate, you don't need necessarily a bunch of fancy toys to get the job done. You can do a lot with very basic things that you have. And now even if, even if the rope crosses, you can still introduce slack to the, to the system. We should get a battery saw over here so we can cut some things. <laughs> That'll be tomorrow. So Lawrence is going to hang out a little longer. Uh, I want to shamelessly plug the new best management practice and rigging. This uh, Lawrence was one of the uh, reviewers of this. Um, took a chance to look at it. You can get this over at the TCIA's booth. This is going to have everything from the basic stuff, kind of wake your way up, more advanced skills, even starting to get in mechanical advantages, and tree weight, and those kind of things. So if you want to get, take a look at that, they got that over the TCA big old booth over there that has all the couches in it. Uh, Lawrence is going to hang out here a little longer with me. If you got some rigging questions, come on up. Other than that, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you guys again at 2:30 uh, with Mike Tilford.